saying this is an honor shame culture that Jesus is in. The whole Bible is actually in a, what we call an honor shame culture where where everybody kind of knows their place in society. And uh, shame is when people try to put you lower than where you actually are. And in this honor shame culture, these religious leaders are going to try to shame Jesus. They're going to try to put him lower than what he is. They're going to try to shame him in front of his disciples and those who are listening. And they keep trying to do that, so to discredit him and to put him down. Um, But uh, he gets the best of them in every one of these exchanges. And he gets the best of them because unlike them, he has no hypocrisy or need for popular approval. And that's what is going to prove itself in the end. Let's uh, say a short prayer and then we'll start reading. Lord our God, I thank you for this word. Send us your spirit so that as we read, we would not just have words going in one ear and out the other. But that, Lord, we would be changed and shaped and molded by who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read starting verses 1 through 12. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Let's stop there for a moment. Jesus here compares the religious leaders to foolish tenants. People who, this is a common arrangement back then that there would be a landowner and then he would have people who lived on the land and would work the land. And in exchange, he would get just a portion of the produce and the the crops that were raised. So he's comparing them to some tenants who are very foolish and not only foolish but cruel. And they mistreat the people who come to try to collect some of the fruit, which is what was common. The prophets often compared God's people to a vineyard. Isaiah 5 would be one example. And so Jesus tells a parable where the vineyard caretakers are foolish and violent. So he's kind of putting them on the spot and saying, you guys are not doing your jobs. In fact, you're being worse than that. You're being cruel and awful. The point of this parable that Jesus told about the tenants here is that there is no end to their wickedness. There's there's no end. They're going to, no matter who God sends to them, they are going to beat, treat shamefully, maybe kill. And that in the end, they are going to kill the Son of God. Which is the, the worst thing that could be done. They would even kill God's son to keep their positions of power. And that is what is going to end up happening when Jesus is crucified. But then Jesus says, hey, there's this scripture. Haven't you read it? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In other words, what is going to happen is that what they reject and kill, God is going to exalt 
So what everybody rejects, Jesus is going to be exalted. He's going to rise from the dead. And he is going to rise in triumph. Not only over the grave, but over all his enemies. He's going to be vindicated by all that he has said and done. So God will make him the cornerstone of a new kingdom. And that's what this passage is about. So they don't like this. And so they come with some challenges. Let's read on. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians, those were the people who stood by King Herod, to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And to God, the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Okay. So the first challenge here is paying taxes. So paying taxes is not a popular thing today. It was definitely not a popular thing back then because people considered Rome their, their overlords and they were, they were cruel and they were oppressive. And you had to pay them taxes. So this is... Not exactly a popular topic, so they try to trap Jesus. They start with flattery, of course, as it says in Proverbs 29, the one who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. They come and they give him all these compliments. Uh, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. You are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. You can tell that they're not very sincere in that, but they're just buttering him up for this trap that they have for him. And it's a trap. Will Jesus anger the people or will he anger Rome? Is he going to lose all of his followers by saying, hey, you should pay taxes? Or is he going to get himself in trouble with the Roman Empire because he's saying, hey, don't pay your taxes? This is a bad pagan government. What's he going to say? If Jesus says not to pay taxes, this would be rebellion against Rome and he would be arrested and get in trouble for sure. And if Jesus says to pay taxes, then he's legitimizing the oppressive Roman rule. So he says, well, do you have one of the coins? Let me see it. And so they brought him a coin. Whose whose portrait is on this coin? Whose inscription is on this coin? Well, it was a picture of of Caesar, and it said on there, son of the divine Augustus, which was the previous Caesar at the time. So the coin itself actually declared that Caesar was the son of God. So there were some Jewish people who even believed that you shouldn't even be carrying that. So he kind of points out that you're already carrying that indirectly. And he says, basically, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. This essentially means give proper respect and the taxes to those in authority. Give theirs what is theirs. It says this also in Romans 13, verse 7. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Respect and honor, they they can have that. Taxes that have their inscription and portrait on it, they can have it. And money and respect were everything to these religious leaders, but Jesus is not swayed by money or respect, and so he can answer honestly and truthfully here. So give proper respect and taxes to those in authority, but give your faith and your hope and yourself to God. That's what Jesus is making a distinction here. Money, 
the government can have that. It's the government's money anyways. They're the ones who put it out and all of that. Even in our money, it says a Federal Reserve note on it. The government puts out money and so they can have what's theirs. But your faith, your hope, your trust, your peace, everything that you are, your entire self, that belongs to God. You belong to God. Don't give the government that. And I think we need to be reminded of this, especially in an election season where, where certain politicians are trumpeted as heroes and their opponents are portrayed as the absolute villains. We need to give our faith and our hope and ourselves not to a candidate or to anything political, but to God himself. We give our votes to Caesar, absolutely. We need to do our civic duty. We need to give taxes and respect to those in authority, and we do our responsibility. But ourselves and our faith belong to God. So there's another challenge here. Let's continue reading. And the Sadducees, that's another school of thought in the Jewish community, came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first one took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise, and the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. So here's a second challenge. Does the Old Testament teach resurrection? This is one of the things that Jewish people who subscribe to the Old Testament debated a lot. And the Sadducees were the school of thought that didn't believe in a resurrection. That, you know, once you're dead, you're dead. That's it. And so they present this challenge to him. They only followed the first five books of Moses. So that's Genesis through Deuteronomy. And so they strictly held that as their scripture and not the rest of what we would call the Old Testament. And in those five books, they didn't see any evidence for people rising from the dead, so they didn't believe it. So they present what they believe is a logical impossibility to disprove the resurrection from the dead. They think that there, there couldn't be a resurrection from the dead because the way that Moses set up these laws that you wouldn't be able to have a resurrection because in the laws it says that you have to raise up offspring for your brother if he would die. So how could, how could seven men have one wife? That doesn't work. So Jesus responds basically saying, you're way off here. You, you don't know scripture and you don't know the power of God. He basically says marriage is an earthly ordinance anticipating something heavenly. Marriage is something for here and now that anticipates something much greater later. This is not something that continues into eternity. This is a, this is a temporary arrangement. That's why the, the vows that we say in marriage is till death do us part. Or as long as we both shall live, not forever into eternity. Jesus says here, not only is marriage a temporary thing that we will 
have for a while while we're on earth. But Jesus also corrects them on resurrection. And Jesus said, there is a resurrection. Even in your scripture, there's a resurrection. You know about the passage of Moses and the burning bush where he talked, God talked to Moses. And he says, Moses himself demonstrates resurrection in Exodus 3 verse 6. When God says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, that means he still is their God. That means they're still alive. He doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. I am. I'm still that God. That means they're still alive. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. In the Apostles' Creed, which we say here at our church, one of the things that we affirm is the resurrection of the body. Let's uh, look at the screen here. How does the resurrection of the body comfort you? Not only my soul will be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head, but even my very flesh, raised by the power of Christ, will be reunited with my soul and made like Christ's glorious body. So when Jesus arose from the dead, never to die again in a body that is glorious beyond our imagination, um, we too one day will rise from our graves wherever we might lay, be laid to rest. We will rise from our graves as well, just like Jesus did from his. Okay, there's another challenge. Starting at verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and that there is none other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So challenge number three, the greatest commandment. Um, they, they studied Moses' law really closely and they came up with 613 commandments. And so there was some debate and discussion about which one was the most important. And so this scribe comes to him and says, um, Teacher, he seems to be asking a genuine question. It's still a challenge, but he seems to honestly want to know. What is the greatest commandment? And he says, first is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And there's a second. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything that Moses commanded hangs on these two commandments. He, what he points out that is, I think is most significant here is that the first and second commandments go together. Those, those two commandments are together. He, doesn't, he was asked about just the greatest commandment, but he doesn't just give the first one. He gives the second one. The second one has to go with the first. And First John picks this up later in the New Testament. It, uh, did I put that on the screen here? There it is. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So these go together. You can't love God and then hate those around you. You can't. That, that's impossible. You, if you love God, you will love those who bear the image of God. It's kind of simple. Verses 35 through 37 now. 
And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. So Jesus offers here a counter challenge, trying to challenge their views on who they think the Christ or the Messiah is. How is the Messiah both the son and the Lord of David? So all through the Old Testament, King David was supposed to have somebody who was going to reign forever. And so everybody was waiting for this this person to come through the line of David who was going to reign forever. And so one of the passages that they believed talked about that was, was this one that he quotes from Psalm 110. But David, this is supposed to be the son of David, but David calls him Lord. What how does that make sense? What Jesus is implying here, but not saying outright, is that the Messiah is not only human, but he's also divine. He's man and God. And that's why David calls him Lord, even though he is a descendant of David. This was outside of their understanding of who this Messiah was going to be. And what he's trying to do here is he's trying to get them to open up and say, Maybe the coming Messiah is a little bit more than what you thought. Look at what scripture says. Their idea of the Messiah was skewed, which is why they failed to see the Messiah in front of them. He was standing right there. He is the Christ or Messiah, same same meaning. And they failed to see him even though he was standing right there. Even though he taught with authority, even though he healed many people and did other miraculous things, they couldn't recognize him. They didn't see him. Verses 38 through 40. And in Jesus' teaching, he said, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. So he warns the crowds about them. Their religion was a mask for pride and greed. That's what was going on. They were spiritual peacocks, as one of my commentaries put it. I thought that that put it pretty well. They liked to show... They liked to appear religious. They liked all of the honor that goes with being religious. But inside, they were really just pride, prideful and greedy. That's all they were. It says they devour widows' houses, which means they sponged on people of limited means. And they were taking money from them even when they didn't need to. So their religion was a mask for pride and greed. This is something that all believers have to watch out for um, all the time. It's very easy, and especially with the pride part. Pride is a beast of a sin because it can sneak up on you, even on good things. You can be proud about good things that you do. And that's why it's, it's maybe one of the chief sins. Because... It can sneak up on you and you can have it even when you don't even realize it. We like to be defensive and such, but pride is really an ongoing challenge for all of us. In contrast to the religious leaders, this is the last part of the chapter. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. There would be this box here and, you know, people would have, you know, a handful of coins and it would make a loud noise when it went into the box. And so you could tell when somebody put in a lot, clink, 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 you know. But if somebody put in just a little bit, it would just go clink. So you could tell who was putting in a lot and who was not putting in much. 
He watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is an example of what Jesus means by devouring widows' houses. So this poor widow shows the most faith of everybody. She is the one who has the most faith. She is the one putting trust in God for her daily bread. Not these people who put in tons of money. She put in one sixty-fourth of a day's wage. So if you were a laborer and you worked for a day, you would get a denarius. She put in one sixty-fourth of a denarius. So if you made $100 a day, this is less than $2. She didn't put in very much at all. What she does demonstrate, though, is sharing our resources for God's work as an act of faith. And Jesus honored that. When you act in faith, Jesus respects that and honors that. It's not that God needs the money. God, as it says in Psalms, owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God doesn't need the money. But it's almost, we need to exercise our faith so that when we are giving to God's work, we are doing something even good for us. We are exercising our faith in God. And I'm not saying this because, you know, money is tight around here or anything like that. That's not, that's not the point. But uh, we give when we give because we need to remember that we depend on the Lord. So, to summarize this chapter, last point for you today, as the Messiah and the Son of God, Jesus is greater than any leader. We need to put our faith in Him. We need to trust Him. Whether a religious leader or a political leader, we put our trust in Him and we look to Him for everything that we need. In a duplicitous, self-seeking world, put your trust in the only one who is actually trustworthy. And let's bow our heads and let's say a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for sending Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into this world. And we pray, Lord, that we would put our trust in you. It's easy, Lord, to put trust in ourselves or our resources, other things, or other people. And yet, Lord, all of those will, will fail us at one point or another. You will never fail us. And so, Lord, please lead each one of us to put our trust in you who is fully trustworthy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.